soul is crying out for more. I want more of you. Whoa. And I won't be satisfied nor content with where I am. Whoa. So I will apprehend Till I'm captured by what I'm after. And I will go from faith, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. And I will go from faith to faith. From glory to glory, and I'll forever be chasing after you. I'll be chasing after you, and I'll forever be chasing after you. Chasing after you Sing for me, Chelsea. I will press toward the mark For the pride I will fade I will fade Cause I can't continue life Day by day I need, I need to be with you and I'll see where you are. Hallelujah. And I will go from faith to faith, from glory. To glory, and I will go from faith to faith, glory, from glory to glory, and I will go, and I will.
presence in you this morning. Last time I gave you statistics. It's going to be short, I promise. Stats for giving among Christians are one out of four American Christians give zero. The median annual giving for Christians is $200. That's a year. And 20% of Christians account for 86% of all giving. Staggering, I know. But this is the truth, right? Why are we talking about money? This is the same reason why I hate coming to church, because y'all always talking about money. Well, let me just tell you, the Bible says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? We talk about money because money, some, to some people, is their treasure. And where you want to find someone's treasure, see where they're throwing their money. Now, we talk about money not because we are uh, all into money and stuff. We talk about money because Jesus talked a lot about money. We talk about money because money it represents who we are. The way we handle money tells a lot about who we are, right? So if we're going to go to the heart of a person, the heart of a Christian, what drives us, what we, uh, how we approach money, that tells us a lot of how we approach godly things. So we're going to get to see that analogy here. Jesus' teachings in the gospel, about 25% of it was about managing money and being good stewards. So that accounts for a quarter of everything Jesus had to say. So don't you think it might be a little bit important? And as a matter of fact, if you want to look it up, it's about 28 uh, uh, passages of scripture in total. That Jesus addresses these things. And the Bible in general has over 800 verses that talk about money and how we treat money and our relationship with money. We're going to get into some of that. Now, uh, so I want to give you uh, a few things here. These are a few categories that the Bible talks about when it comes to money. And you can go back and study these things in detail later. I always recommend that you do that, right? Okay, you guys good? Money makes you nervous? I know. But it's going to be fine. We're going to get through this. Amen. All right. Number one, the Bible talks about things like planning and budgeting. Oh, you thought it was only about not sinning on Saturday night? No, the Bible actually has a lot of practical information to give us, right? And some people are good at planning and budgeting. Some people are just planning to budget. And it never happens. And so you got people who really want to make that happen. People who are trying really hard, you know, buying those planners in January. You know, those planners for the whole year. And then around July, you realize that you don't know where it is because you haven't been using it. So then you're like, I'm just going to go to the digital one so it can just always be on my phone. And anywhere I go, I can just have it with me and I can be all organized and stuff. And then you... Don't use it. But here's the thing. Here, here is what's funny. You guys know that my career for 20 plus years has been in the area of finances, right? In the area of finances. But what's ironic is my wife came to me the other day and she says, Babe, I, I, think, I think we had the wrong careers. We had the, each other's careers because her career was in retail management. She says, I'm the one who is good with money. And you're the one who's like a used car salesman. You could sell stripes to a zebra. So I don't really know, you know, if that is true per se. But needless to say, some people are naturally good with money and some people are not. And if you're not a person who's naturally good with money, it's okay. It could be one of those learning curve things, right? Because we're not good at everything that we should be doing. Amen? Amen. It's just going to take a little bit of work. Here is what Luke 14, 28 to 30 has to say. And by the way, I have been given the NIV a very bad rap, as you know. I use it as, you know, a lot of jokes and stuff. And I tease people who use the NIV as not being real Christians. 
But I'm in the NIV. The NIV is actually a really good trusted translation. I'm going to give it a little bit of a redemption. Sounds like y'all are NIV people. Y'all NIV people? All right, all right, all right. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. Yeah, redemption in the house of God. All right, so here's what it says. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Any of y'all want to build a tower? Never mind. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone will see and will ridicule you saying, ha, 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 this person began to build but wasn't able to finish, right? What is the Bible saying? What do we do here? First, what? Sit down. Not run out to Lowe's and Home Depot. Sit down. Talk to your wife who's better at budgeting than you are. (laughs) Run the numbers. See what's going on. Figure this thing out, right? And that way we know how to approach. And then estimate the cost. How many of us run headlong? Don't raise your hand because, you know, just rhetorical. Just think about it in your mind. But how many of us, we run headlong into projects and things that require money without counting the cost, right? I I talked a little bit about this the other day. I said some of us who are visionaries may not always be good at budgeting because we see in projects, right? People who are good at budgeting, they see in dollar signs. So you visionaries need to have a good budget person that you work with. Because you're going to throw out some really cool ideas and then your budget person is going to shut them all down and bring reality to you. Amen? And so this is what the Bible says. Let's also look at Proverbs 21.5. It's okay. All good. Proverbs 21.5. It says, the plans of the diligent lead to what? Profit. As surely as haste leads to poverty. I'll give you one more just because you want to. Proverbs 24.27. It says, put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. And after that, do what? Build your house. We built a house in the Bahamas. This was around 2002, one, two, three, three. See, she does the budgeting. She knows. And we literally had to sit. I remember sitting and going through plans. I mean, it's a very daunting process. Anybody who's ever gone through this, you know what I'm talking about. But we sat there and we literally had to plan out what we need. And at the time, you know, we got kids. How many bedrooms do you need? How, many, how much square footage? You know, do you need that little extra gazebo thingy in the back? You know, what are you going to do? And so, what? Okay. And so we went through this process and I will tell you one thing. If we had gone on property or on site, because we used to, you know, spend lunch hours on property just pulling up on them. What y'all doing? What's going on? Can I see? And we, we, you know, we did that. We were those people. And uh, if we didn't have the plans, we didn't know what we were looking at. We wouldn't know what we would be spending. We wouldn't know if we were over budget, if we could afford this place, what was happening. So it's important. And the Bible really is telling us that it's not a bad thing to talk about money. Some of us cringe when it comes to talking about money. Right? And, and, and you guys know y- your pastor is one of them people. So that's why he knew what he was going to The Bible says, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And that's why. Because she knows. Right? So there's that. And then number two, this is the second category the Bible talks about, which is saving and investing. Saving and investing. Let's look at Proverbs 13, 11. It says, whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. I know some of you in here, you're financial people. I see y'all. I see y'all. And I respect that. And I know you understand this concept, this principle. You spend your careers teaching people the importance of saving money and investing well, right? And so it's important for us to see that in the scope of Christianity as well. Because see, the way we handle our finances are, is a way that, we, that you can tell how we steward things. Right? What's stewardship? Stewardship is how you take care of what God's put in your care. That's what stewardship means. So everything that God's giving us or has given us, we are responsible to be good stewards of. Amen? I'll tell you one thing. I I, I know uh, if you're married and you have a household, let me just tell you what the secret is. This is the secret to running a successful household. Right? You ready for this? Play to your strengths. 
Each, each of you play to your strengths. I, I know the man is the head of the home and all of that, but what the head of the home can do is delegate authority in the areas that he's not good, right? Play to your strengths. And I know this has worked out successfully with us in the, you know, in, in the past, uh, but I, I know that we hate, though, when people play to their strengths and it's the opposite of us. I, I'll give you an example. It's like my wife, right? I hate when she has to come to me like, I hope you used a coupon for that. <laughs> or, uh, did you remember to get the receipt? You know, stuff like that. But here is the thing. Here is the thing. Here is the thing. I'm good with time. And so she hates when I'm like, babe, we got to leave in 20 minutes or else we're going to be late. And you know, pastors can't be showing up late. She hates when I talk about time. And I hate when she talks about money. But we appreciate it from each other, right? And so it's no shame if you're not good at something. Allow the person who is strong in that area to do their thing. And this is how we complement each other. And if we need to grow in any of those areas, then we need to grow. And we need to be okay with that. Amen. Amen. All right. And then there's giving to the poor. The Bible talks about giving to the poor. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to whom? The Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. So think about the times when you help somebody who is less fortunate than you. God honors that so much that he says, it's just like you did it for me. He's like, I felt that. I felt that. What you did, I felt that. That's like doing it for me. Amen? And then there's debt and tithing. Romans 13, 7 says, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, respect. Honor, then honor. So what is God saying here? Don't cheat your taxes. Don't be running up those credit cards and not paying it. That's not good Christian stewardship. Uh Uh-oh. Manage those finances well. Amen. And then there's faithfulness and stewardship. Proverbs 28, 20. This is the promise. A faithful person will be, shout it out, richly blessed, but the one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. Okay, so there is obviously a difference between someone who is running after wealth for the wrong reasons and somebody who is managing wealth and doing it the right way, right? Jesus made it clear in in Scripture and in the Gospels That we can either make wealth our idol, or we can use it as a source of worship. Not the, but a source of worship. So the question is, what are you doing with your money? Living to get it makes it an idol, right? While living to give it makes it a tool for worship. Because see, money is just a tool. Not something to be worshipped. There is a means to an end when it comes to money. And money is not inherently evil. Let me just say that right now. Because I know sometimes you hear these messages and they talk like money is like bad. Right? And then, you know, people like to quote, money is the root of all evil. No, the Bible does not say that. That's a misquote. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Why is the love of money at the root of all evil? Because money funds whatever you want. It funds whatever you're into. Right? If you want to be rich, if you want to be affluent, if you want certain toys, whatever it is, money can get you there. Right? So money is not inherently evil. People are. And it's the way people use money that makes it an evil situation. Right? Okay. So two common but erroneous teachings about wealth. There are two common teachings about money out there that's erroneous. It's error. It's wrong, right? And you may have heard of them. One is called the prosperity theology, also known as the prosperity gospel. And you probably know that one very well, but what you may not know is there's also one called the poverty theology, which is the opposite of the prosperity gospel, right? So let's go with the prosperity theology first. It considers those who are rich to be more righteous than those who are poor. That's in essence what the prosperity theology 
is all about. So in essence, it, it elevates the haves over the have-nots, right? And it honors people for uh, being affluent and says that they are so full of faith because of what they have. And this is not realistic. And I think sometimes people who have been blessed, maybe by God, they assume that this is God's desire for everyone. So they preach this message that if I have it, everyone should have it. And if you don't have it, then you have broken faith. And that's a wrong teaching. Right? Because what it does is it gives people this impression that the worship really should be about the stuff and the getting and not about the one who gives. So if we lean into the prosperity theology, then we're going to always be looking for God to give us handouts. And if that's not happening, we think something's broken. I know. I got it. Amen? And then you have the the poverty theology. Now, this one considers those who are poor to be more righteous than those who are rich. And it honors those who are sacrificial, who are intentionally giving up everything, and they're calling them righteous for doing that. Now, I've seen this go to great extremes. There's a very popular preacher that decided to leave everything here in America, gave up his his very, very influential uh, mega ministry to go to a foreign country and just kind of have nothing. Now, there are times when God will call us to do things like that, right? But there are some, though, that do it for this reason. They're doing it because they believe more in the poverty theology that if I have something, then something's wrong with having something, so I got to give up everything to prove to God that I'm a Christian. And there is something wrong with that. As a matter of fact, there are three things wrong with that. Let me give you the problem number one. Problem number one is this can actually result in rejecting some of God's blessing. Sometimes God just wants to bless you with something. And if you are busy throwing out everything he's giving you, then you can, in fact, reject a blessing from God. Problem two is it can lead to pride. Because then you give up all this stuff and then you've successfully lived that life that you wanted to live and suddenly it's all about you and the fact that you're so sacrificial and oh, look at me, God. We call that piety in the Bible, right? And then there's problem number three, which is it has its roots in pagan worship. It's this belief that you have to inflict pain and suffering on yourself for a greater good. Why is that wrong? A couple of reasons. Number one, Jesus has already received the pain and suffering on our behalf. We don't have to inflict pain and suffering on ourselves. Number two, Number two, there's enough pain and suffering to go around as it is. And eventually, if you're a real Christian, you're going to run into some of that. The Bible says, sufficient is it the trouble of today, of of tomorrow. Let tomorrow deal with itself. You're going to have enough trouble today. In other words, things are going to happen, right? We know this. And so we cannot try to uh, do what pagan worshipers did thinking that it's righteous. Because you know what it's the same as? Those who cut themselves. <clears throat> Anybody know of cutters? People who've cut themselves? I think there are people in this church that's gone through that. But you remember Jesus had seen the demoniac hanging outside the graveyard. And what was he doing? He was cutting himself. And Jesus had to cast those demons out of him, right? Right? So it has its roots in pagan worship. We don't have to inflict pain on ourselves to prove anything. Excuse me. Jesus has already proven himself for us. So poverty and prosperity theology, those are kind of half-truths. There is some truth to to those things, but they're only half-truths. But the Bible in general gives us a better balance of how we should approach money. And I want to give you four categories of people in the Bible When it comes to money, right? You guys are going to like this. This is going to be awesome. Four categories of people in the Bible when it comes to relationship with money. You guys ready? All right. Ready to take notes? Number one, there is the righteous rich. One category is the righteous 
rich. These are people who work hard for their money. They earn it honestly. They make sound investments. They live within a reasonable budget. Pay their bills and taxes. Give generously. And these are the ones that would say, you know what? I have a lot and I feel I should give a lot. God's blessed me. I want to be a blessing to somebody else. They understand finances. So the Bible talks about the righteous rich. Here are some biblical examples of righteous rich. You got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. You guys remember him? He's the one who gave up his grave for Jesus. You have Lydia. She was the lady who funded much of Paul's ministry. And then you have Dorcas. She was often helping the poor with what she had. So there are righteous rich that are in the Bible. Let me read for you 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. And this is Paul's admonition to Timothy. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good work, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this they will lay up treasures for themselves as a foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So what he is saying here is you got some rich people in your church, and you have to teach them to have the right relationship with money. Because how many of you know, there are two schools of thought on this. One school of thought says, money will destroy you. It will change you and make you somebody else. And then there's the other school of thought that says, money is just going to expose who you already were. You just now have an opportunity to do it. I don't know which side of the fence you think you, 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 you're on on that, but those are the two options. And then the second category is the unrighteous rich. These are ones who are dishonest gain. They have dishonest gain driven by greed, heavy spending, poor money management. They're ungenerous, and some of us will call it stingy. And these are the ones who says, I love what I have so much that I want what you have too. And they don't stop at the wealth that they have amassed for themselves, but they are continuing in the pursuit of taking everybody else's as well. This is the unrighteous rich. Here are some biblical examples of the unrighteous rich. You have Laban, Esau, Nabal, Haman, the rich young ruler, you remember him, and Judas Iscariot, who stole from the treasury in Jesus' ministry. Proverbs 28.8 says this, Whoever increases wealth... By taking interest or profit from the poor, amasses it for another who will be kind to the poor. So in other words, what Jesus is saying is when you mistreat other people and you get rich off of them, that money ain't going to stay in your hands. Eventually, God's going to make sure that gets into the hands of somebody else who's going to do the right thing with it. Not my words. Jesus' words. And then you have category three, which is the righteous poor. These are ones who are honest and hardworking. They manage well the little that they do have. They live within their means and they stay out of debt. So when they get those credit card applications in the mail, these are the ones who say, you know what? I don't have much, but I'm thankful for what I have. I'm going to take care of what I have. Because you know what? It could have been worse. Because I might think I have little, but just up the street, there's somebody that has less than I do. So I'm going to take care of what I have. They're what we call content. That's a word we need to learn in America, is how to be content. There is, an dis there is a discontent in our world today. You guys know this. Oh, we're content for five minutes until we see what somebody else got. Then suddenly what we got ain't good enough no more. Or oh, don't let that YouTuber, hey, they don't call them influencers for nothing. Don't let them influence you 
to jump on whatever bandwagon they're selling. Come on, y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. All right, so here are some biblical examples of righteous poor. You have Ruth, Naomi, the widow who gave her a mite. You remember her? The Macedonian church. You got Paul, and of course, you got Jesus Christ himself. Jesus did not come from an affluent family. Jesus didn't come from wealth and money. Well, he did event, uh, originally in heaven. The Bible says he gave up all of that. But here on earth, he came in a very humble way, right? Humble family, just regular, poor, righteous, hardworking people. And then category four is the unrighteous poor. And these are the ones who seek sinful gain. So they're like, I don't have nothing. I'm going to get me something, but it ain't going to be done the right way. They're often freeloading and stealing. So these are the ones who are really, really, really bad news. Because they have foolish spending habits and they're often very lazy. Not to mention ungenerous. So these are the ones who typically have a champagne taste on a beer budget. Did I say that in church? I'm not condoning drinking, by the way. It's only an analogy. Lighten up. Here are some biblical examples of the righteous, the unrighteous poor. It would be both the sluggard, ay, 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 the sluggard and the fool who are repeatedly mentioned in the book of Proverbs. You can just hold on to that, brother. You probably need it more than I do. See how I just, yeah. Right, so let me give you an example. Proverbs 24, 30 to 34. It says, I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who had no sense. Okay, so this is already not starting off very well. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and I learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep. A little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. This is talking about the person who literally can't get up to do something to save their lives. They always want to chill. They always want to rest. They're always too tired to do anything. Or to make something of their lives. But they're always leaning on somebody else to fix all their problems for them. They have health and can work, but choose not to. Because it's too difficult. Matter of fact, I was going to share this scripture with you, and I didn't. But there is one that says that this type of person says, I can't go to work today because there might be a lion outside that will eat me. You don't believe me? Go look it up. There's literally a a scripture in Proverbs that says that. So people will go through great lengths, go to great lengths to come up with the excuses to not do what they're supposed to do, right? But here is the, the deal. Here's the deal. Scripture doesn't teach prosperity theology. Scripture doesn't teach poverty theology. Scripture teaches us to be good, responsible Christian stewards with what we have. And let me just say, some of you, God will bless with a lot. And some of you, God will bless with a little. There are things that we can control in this life, and there are things that we cannot control in this life. And where we go wrong is when we try to control things that God says, I'm in control of. Right? Now, to a certain extent, yes, you can control things by the principles the Bible gives us. Things like hard work, a good work ethic, putting in good principles, using wisdom. Those things will produce good results, right? Because they are principles. But beyond that, if you've done the work and you've put in the principle work, whatever your result is, that's your result. We don't try beyond that. And when we are believers and we're trusting God by faith, once we've done what he's expected us to do, we have to leave it with him. And when he says, I will bless you, whatever that blessing looks like, we have to be okay with that blessing. And the problem is we have our eyes in our neighbor's yard too much. We let what other people have affect whether or not we're satisfied.
But what if we lived in one of the poorest nations in the world and you have the same things there that you have now? You would be the richest dude in town or the richest gal on the block. It's all perspective. And so God is saying here, be content, be happy with what you have. If you've got God, you've got everything. And whatever he supplies is what we need. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but this is a message I think that everybody in this room can learn from. Yeah, some of you, I know you're very good with money. Some of you, not so much. But I think this here is something we can all take a piece of this and say, you know what, this is my piece. This is the piece God gave me today. I'm going to work this piece. Amen. So what does God want us to do? Work hard and honestly for what we have. Manage it well. And again, I go back to the point. If you, don't, if you can't manage it well, get someone to help you. Be content with your portion. Give generously. You know what the, the, the leveling field is between the prosperity gospel and the poverty gospel? Giving. Generosity. Generosity levels the playing field. Because if you are a generous person... Because don't even think money. Just think generosity, right? Because this message is about more than money. I don't know if you've noticed that. But generosity is a heart to give. Having a heart to give, right? If you have a heart of generosity, money is just one of the things on the list that you get to give. People who are generous don't mind giving time. They don't mind lending their talent. You have some people who don't like to lend their talent. They're like, "Mm, I'm too good for that. If I'm going to do that, you got to pay me some big bucks. Because you don't know what I'm worth. Right? That's not a heart of generosity. And so whatever it is that we have, if we have a heart of generosity, the Bible says that we will be even more blessed when we give. And I know we don't, it doesn't, Makes sense because you're like, if I have something and then I throw it away, I ain't got nothing. But that is not the way it works in the kingdom of God. God's kingdom works differently from the kingdom down here. God actually says, the more you give, the more you get. If you practice being generous, you are invoking and inviting the giving nature of God into your life. And that's why the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. That's what he means by that. Why? Because your heart's in the right place. Your heart's in the right place. Amen. And if your heart's in the right place, money is nothing. You won't think about the money because you're thinking about generosity in general. Make sense? And then finally, we need to honor God with what we have. If you want to decide whether or not what you're doing is the right thing, think about whether or not it honors God. So just always ask yourself that question. Do do I think God's pleased with this? Do I think God may have a problem with this? Right? That's the litmus test when it comes to your generosity and the way that you present money. Now, if you want to talk about money itself, we believe the old we know the Old Testament teaches the tithe, which is the tenth part. The New Testament mentions the tithe, but doesn't teach the tithe, the way we look at it is Jesus gave a better covenant. Everything is elevated in the new covenant, right? So if the old covenant expectation was 10%, then that should be the beginning of the new, not the end of the new. Make sense? We call that the floor, not the ceiling. So our giving should start at 10%. Now, again, the Bible doesn't spell that out in the New Testament, but we look at the principles that are laid out in the Word of God. And anytime you want to decide what the Bible says about something, you look at the entire Bible, not just pick one verse. And you understand what the Bible is saying to us. Now, having said that, what the New Testament does say is that each person decide in their hearts what they will give. So each of us have to make a decision, how generous do I want to be? Right? God's not holding anybody to any particular number. We get to decide. So I don't know what kind of heart you will have after this message. I know we do have wonderful, generous givers in this church. We praise God for you. I gave you the statistics on the percentages of people that that give. So we're no different from any other church. 
It's the small few that hold things together. That's just being real, right? But I want to end with this scripture. It's Proverbs 11, 24 to 25. It says, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. See, this is why God has set this principle in place. Because generosity is always about somebody else. And we have been programmed to think about ourselves. So God is saying, if you begin to get your mind on other people and their needs and their concerns and what they may need from you, I will reward you. Don't look for them to pay back. I will reward that. Amen? So in other words, he is personally invested in your generosity. Amen. That gives me peace. That gives me hope. My wife and I live by that principle. We don't have to worry about things because we know that when we give, God's going to take care of us. If you've been around here a while, you know our story. We migrated from another country with four kids as adults at a time when I thought I was done with college years. I was already in my 30s, already had my career. I had people that I know who had gone off to college. I always felt bad that I never went off to college right after high school. I just went straight into the field. And from the first summer after leaving high school in 1986, I had a job working construction in the Bahamian heat. We were building a hotel over on Paradise Island. It was hot, and I'm an AC kind of guy. And I was like 12 shades blacker after two weeks. And my mom worked at the bank, so she used to feel so sorry for me. I used to come stumbling in the bank, out of breath, trying to catch a little AC in some water. She's like, my poor son. So then, of course, I got a job in the bank after that and had a 20-year career. But we moved to this country as adults. And when God called us to Bible college, I'm like, what? We're, we're still going to go to college in our 30s? And we left. And God said, sell everything. Your brand new house you just built, just a few steps from the beach. And pull your kids out of school. And you're all going to go to America. We didn't know what that looked like. We didn't know how long we were going to be gone, when we would come back. We thought we were just going to graduate, go back home, plan a church in the Bahamas. And then I had a friend that passed away a few years later. I flew home to the funeral. The moment the plane landed, God said, uh, no, y'all are not coming back here to plant the church. You're going to plant that in America. And we are like, but we have nothing and we know nobody and we... How are we going to? And we got four kids. Did you remember that part, God? He says, Yeah, I know. He says, But I'm going to be your supplier. And let me just tell you, it's been two decades, almost two decades since we've been in America. And God has never forsaken us. We didn't come from ascending church. You know the parent churches that have all this money and they plant these little churches. They said, how much money do you need? I, I've actually met, a, met pastors here that came to Vegas with large budgets. They're like, oh, my church gave me $100,000 to go find a building and, 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 you know, and all of that stuff. And it's awesome. And I'm like, that's so cool. I mean, I thank God for ministries like that because they ended up sub to us at one point. So because of their budget, we were able to, to have a place, right? But there we were, going through all of these different phases of life and ministry. Ministry was new to us. Church planning was new to us. We didn't learn how to plan a church in Bible college, okay? We might have graduated with honors. Both of us did. But I got some 
Well, she isn't here today. We got people who were at Bible college with us that go to this church, and they will tell you, they don't teach you that. You got to learn that on your own, buddy. And so I'm trying to be bivocational, work a regular job, plan a church, did that for seven years. Thank God seven's the number of completion because it just about killed me. And after seven, I'm like, am I done, Lord? Peace. But it was a walk of faith. We didn't have resources, money, influence, nothing. We came to this town. We knew about two people. But God never failed us, never forsook us. And any opportunity we had to give something, we did. We gave our time. We gave the little money we had. I will never forget. We sold our house, our house in the Bahamas. And we were already scrapping for money. We barely had enough money to move states with the money we got from selling our house. And this is not to, to put any value on anything that you're going to do or decide to do. Please just understand it in the context of me sharing our story. That's it. But my wife and I looked at each other, barely could make ends meet. And we wrote a check for $10,000 and gave it to our church. With the proceeds we made from that money, from selling our house. Could we afford to do that? Heck no! Are you kidding? By the time we moved from Columbus, Ohio to Jacksonville, Florida, we were back broke again, starting all over. So why the heck did we give that money? I don't know. We just were generous. We wanted to give because God always takes care of us. That's why. And if you haven't heard this story, I'm going to tell you. I know some of y'all are sick of hearing it, but I'm going to say it again. Because you can't hear the first part and not hear the second part, right? So when God called us from Jacksonville to, to Vegas, we hit the road, came here to help a church who had a small budget, gave us a small budget. We ran out of money, Flagstaff, Arizona. Broke again. Three of our kids were with us. The fourth one stayed behind for a little bit. End of the day, tired, hungry, no, nowhere to sleep, no food, 40 bucks left in my pocket. God said, stop, feed your family. So we pulled over to a pizza joint, blew the 40, didn't know what we were going to do next. As we were leaving, God showed me a hotel. He said, go into the hotel. Asked him how much is the rate. Made, made no sense, had no money. Asked about the rate. Met this stranger, never met before, who told me to call my wife out the car, which I did. Introduced the two of them. Long story short, the stranger paid for our room, didn't know our situation at all. She asked me one question, what's your name and where you going? And I told her my name, going to Vegas, what you going to do? Three, what you going to do? We're going to help a church. Okay, that's it. She paid for our rooms and gave us 200 bucks, which brought us all the way to Vegas from Flagstaff, Arizona. And from that point, it's just been stuff that just God's just been doing things now am I telling you that if you give your very last you'll walk out of here and God's gonna just meet the very next need I don't know man I'm not gonna tell you that that's up to God what I am gonna tell you is he's faithful he is faithful he is faithful and when we put him first he honors that when we're generous to others he honors that because it means our faith is not in our wallet our faith is not in our bank account. No, 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 no. Our faith is in Him. That means if we broke or if we got a couple of dollars, we're good either way. And that's my heart for you, church. That's my heart for you in this message. That's God's heart for you. Is that no matter what your situation looks like, right now you might not know how you're going to pay for lunch after you leave here. Listen, you know what I want you to do? Rejoice. But it don't make sense to rejoice. I know, right? That's the beauty of it. Because me and this girl, we were in Bible school and there were days we couldn't buy a 25 cent donut. And then when it's there for what, two days, they reduce it to 10 cent. And there were days we couldn't buy the 10 cent donut to have a cup of coffee when we went to school or breakfast to eat. 
before we went to class. But God was faithful. Because after school, buddies would be like, hey, let's go eat at Cracker Barrel or something. And we'd be like, yeah, we can see y'all later. They're like, no, we're coming too. Y'all coming with us. He always provided. Somebody said, hey, I just feel like treating y'all today. Can I treat y'all? I'm like, okay, whatever. I, one time I had my buddy jump in the car, ask me if he could drive my car. I'm like, that's weird. Okay. He drove to the gas station and filled the thing up with gas. God is faithful. That's all I'm trying to say. But he looks for the heart of generosity. That last scripture that I just quoted, that's his heart toward people whose heart are toward him and toward others. We have to stop being so selfish and self-minded if we want to invoke that kind of blessing on our lives. Amen? Amen. And I know some of you, this is not a beat down. Some of you just have a more difficult time with this than others. Some of you, it's the way you were raised or the environment that you're in. You're told to hustle, hustle, hustle. Some of you came from nothing. So you work harder than everybody else to make sure that the life you have for your kids is going to be better than the life that you've had. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's put everything into perspective. Let's always honor him first and let him supply all of our needs. Right? As a matter of fact, isn't that what the Bible says? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then everything we need will be given to us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message today. I pray that it was successful in hitting its target today. I know it hit me afresh and anew. And I thank you for everyone listening, everyone watching. I know, Lord God, that you have spoken. So I pray that every heart would be melted with the word that you've given them. I pray that where we need to change, that that change happens. And we bless you, we honor you, and we praise you. We thank you, Lord God for a church that is flourishing. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone shouted together.